Christmas Carol Chapter One continued. For supper glee at the present time, many thousands are in want of some common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no presents? Asked, asked Scrooge. Plain, plain, plenty of presents, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the Union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor. Then said Scrooge, both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it, under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or nobody to the multitude returned to the gentleman. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of room. We choose this time because it is a time of all others, when one is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, there is my answer, I don't make merry self myself at Christmas, and I can afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishment I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had to better do it. And decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that, but you might know it. Observed the gentleman. It's not my business. Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to inf- interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to purchase their point. The gentleman withdrew. Screw resumed his labor with an improved opinion of himself, and in a more fatuous temper than it was usual with him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened. The people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before horses in carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church whose gruff old bell was always peeping silly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became visible, invisible, and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibration afterwards, as if it teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense in Main Street at the corner of the court, some Laborers were preparing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier round which a party of red men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blazing rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowed, suddenly con- congealed, and turned to Miss Anthropic eyes. The brightness of the shops, where holy sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp, heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. Porters and grocers' trade became a splendid joke. A glorious pageant with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor in the stronghold of my dimension housed gave orders to fifty 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 cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor whom he had fined five shillings on the previous Monday for being drunken, drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred off tomorrow's pudding in his garret 
while his lean wife and the baby sally out to buy the beef foggier yet and colder Sur piercing searching biting cold if the good saint tunstein son had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that instead of using his familiar weapons then indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose the owner of one scanty young nose snowed and murmured by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs stood down as scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a christmas carol but at the first sound of god bless you merry gentlemen may nothing you dismay scrooge seized the ruler with such energy of action that the singer fled in terror leaving the keyhole to the frog and even more congenial frost at length the honor hour of shutting up the counting house arrived with an ill will scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank who instantly snuffed his kettle out candle out and put on his hat you will want all day tomorrow i suppose said scrooge if quite convenient sir it's not convenient says scrooge it's not fair if i was to stop half a crown for it i'd think yourself ill-used i will be bound the clock smiled faintly and yes said scrooge you don't think me ill-used and i pay a day wage for no work the clock observed that it was only once a year a poor excuse for picking a man pocket every fifty feet 25th of December, says Scrooge, burning his grip coat to the chin, but I suppose you must have the whole day be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clock, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, went down a slide on Core Hill. At the end of the lane, a boy's twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blyman's Bluff.